Attention. Um, my name is Kelly Higgs. I am the executive director for New Jersey VOAD, Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. How many people have heard of VOAD before today? Oh, wow, we have a friendly room. Great. So, well, for those of you who haven't heard of VOAD, what we do is we work in partnership with um, organizations that have a disaster related mission or focus. Most of which you probably do know. They're the household names like the Salvation Army and Catholic Charities and Team Rubicon and the Zushi Foundation and the Red Cross. The organizations are out on the front lines. We work behind the scenes to coordinate among all those organizations to make sure that the response is much more effective, uh, that there's not a duplication of resources and services, and that hopefully we have much better outcomes for everybody who's impacted by the disaster. And so we're working in, you know, today in like the blue skies and then also when the skies are not so blue, uh, when things like Harvey and Sandy and things like that hit either our shores or the shores of our neighbors. So that's who NJVOAD is. And so when we were first approached, I, and I apologize for reading notes, but if I speak extemporaneously, you'll still be here a half an hour later and I won't even be halfway done. So I have to sort of stick to the script here. So um, we held our call to collaboration in October 2015. And we had really strong participation across all the sectors that we work with. Uh, but our audience was a little bit of a departure for Creative New Jersey because we're not, well, while we see ourselves as a community, we're not geographically bound by one locale other than New Jersey. And even then, several of our members have a national or even an international focus. Um, but we were all bound by one common issue, and that was really Hurricane Sandy and the response and the recovery, which actually still, recovery still continues today, almost six years later. Um, so New Jersey VOAD's call to collaboration was called Creative NJ VOAD, and it was an opportunity to honestly and constructively take a look at where we were in that Sandy response and recovery. What went well, what didn't go so well, where were some areas for improvement, and where could we build upon, not just for us in New Jersey, but also to help other other areas that were to be impacted in the future by future disasters. So there were several common themes that emerged and what we did was we formed working groups out of those core common themes that emerged. And so um, I actually on the table behind you I do have some handouts for anybody who's interested that sort of break down some of what I'm talking about and I'm happy to talk to anybody further about it. But we, we had an advocacy and a public policy work group that pulled together. And that was one of the areas that we really saw there was a, a lot of need and, and a lot of different areas. One of the areas where I think we had the most impact was in telling our collective story. Because one of the things, here we were three years after Sandy, and when people would ask, well, what, what's the impact? How many people are still out of their homes? How much has been done? We, nobody could really quantify that. And so what we did was we spent some time really working with our member organizations, and we pulled in um, feedback from more than 150 different nonprofit organizations that were involved in response and recovery. And what we did was we pulled that information together and we created a statewide um, summary of what the nonprofit impact was um, for Sandy at that point. And that was at the three year point. So that's available online on our website for anybody to take a look. Um, and that, that really, you know, gives both a narrative of what's been done, but also some really, some really key figures in terms of, of the total impact. We helped more than 30,000 people rebuild their homes. You know, and we, we, help, we had more than, the, the total figure in terms of volunteer hours is over $75 million dollars that, that actually it sort of it translates into in terms of the impact and so it really is quite telling what we were able to do as a nonprofit community as a collective of all those different organizations so um, in addition to that we had a disaster case management working group that pulled together and we developed some disaster response process improvements that have already benefited communities in Texas and in Florida and in Louisiana um, and so what we what we did was we, we worked with these organizations that were in the in the working group and we tried to take that collective learning and wisdom from Sandy and say, how can we make this better the next time? And one of the, there were two key things that we did. First, we, we, we talked a lot about where survivors were at this point. And this was a three, four, five years at this point, because this was a process that went on for about two years. And what were some of the biggest barriers that they had to their own recovery? And so we, we created sort of these do's and don'ts. Like, what, what were the things that, that the people who were already home and back where they should be, what did they do that was in common that, that help them to be able to recover? And then what were some of the problems and barriers that, that limited people's being able, ability to be able to return home? So we, we created this resource guide, and then it was tested out by some of our members who helped out with um, the, the floods in Louisiana and some smaller scale floods in Pennsylvania. And then I was actually asked to deploy to Texas after Hurricane Harvey to support their recovery efforts. And that became, that, that, that guide that we had actually became the foundation 
of Hurricane Harvey's recovery guide for the state of Texas. Um, so uh, that's really cool that this was something that started here in New Jersey and is, is now on a, on a national scale. Um, the, the other thing too that happened with survivors is there's an abundance of paperwork that people have to fill out. And they have to fill out the same thing 20 different times for every different piece of service that they get. And so we pulled together all the service providers that were active in Sandy and said, what are the core things that you all need to have on that piece of paper? And can we agree to have one common screening form where we get that information once from the survivor and then they don't have to tell it again and again and again. And if you have additional information, fine, you can add it on as addendums. But this is, it just makes it easier because every time that, that survivor has to retell their story, they're reliving it. And, and it just all comes comes back to the surface and so we wanted to minimize that as much as possible. So that that's a tool that's also been used in Louisiana and in Florida and actually when it was taken to Florida it was translated into Spanish and brought back to New Jersey for us to be able to use as a bilingual form for anybody who needs it in New Jersey. And then we had a do donations and volunteer working group that focused on managing the effectiveness of those post-disaster, sort of secondary disasters that happen. Um, people who want to help and mean really, really well, um, but they're not sort of following the protocol. So they say, oh, you know, everybody must need clothing. They've lost everything. So I'm going to send my old clothes because that's what everybody needs, right? Or, um, you know, I, I want to help and I'm just going to show up and be there and that's going to be, that's going to brighten somebody's day. But those are things that actually interfere more than they help. Um, the Governor's Office of Volunteerism, their phone number got out on, the, uh, on one of the Governor's press conferences. 18,000 calls and cell phone messages that came through to this one number. So that's not, an, that's not a response, that's not, a, you know, that's not helpful to anybody. So we worked closely with our governmental partners and, and we had created a resource called helpnjnow.org. And this was actually done before our creative NJ VOAD event. But what we did after that was we really took that tool and said, okay, there's still, even though we have this tool now in place and this becomes um, what it does in a disaster, it, it be, basically becomes a virtual volunteer reception center. So when we have a major disaster and we know it, if we know it's coming like it's a hurricane and we can see it three days out, we can activate that and be start messaging that if you want to help, go to helpnjnow.org and then people can register to volunteer. And then that way they're in a system, we know what their skills are, we know where, when they're available. If we're looking for a Spanish speaking nurse in Highlands, we can find somebody who can hopefully fill that need. And so that was one of the big things that we had. But we said, you know, that's not enough because we know that, that people are still going to come. So we said, you know, one of the partnerships that grew out of Creative New Jersey VOAD was with the state library system. And we said, there's libraries in every community. So why don't we have libraries be the physical place where if people show up, we can redirect them to the library and say, go to Help NJ now and you fill out your registration form and then we'll let you know you know what our needs are and everything along those lines. So it helps to sort of fill some of those gaps. And the other thing too with the donations, we created a portal for those, the donations management so that when people want to donate, they can make an offer instead of just showing up with a truckload of flip-flops on November 3rd after we just had a snowstorm following Hurricane Sandy. Not what we needed, right? Um, and so what we did was we created this portal so they can make those offers and then we can work with our, our folks at the county and the state level to figure out what the needs are and, and try to direct those needs directly to where they're needed. Or just say, you know what, we don't need that at this point, but maybe we will when we get to recovery. Can you hold on to it for us? And, and have a a better system for managing that but we also know again people are just still going to come and they're going to out of the, their own goodwill and their their own good intentions want to try to help and so we partnered with organizations that are already taking that stuff that we don't necessarily want to have to manage after a disaster they're doing it on a daily basis the Salvation Army goodwill we created partnerships with them to be able to accept that stuff. And then in exchange for that, they'll give us vouchers to give to the survivors so that that way they can shop for what they need when they need it. So we're just using the system that we have and building on those relationships that we have in place to be able to try to foster a more effective and more, not just a recovery and response for everybody who's impacted, but a ways, avenues for people who want to help to be able to find those, find their niche and to be able to do it in a much more effective way. We're sort of controlling the messaging because other, if you don't tell people what they need, they'll decide it for you. And so we want to make sure that we're deciding what we need and communicate that. Um, one of the things that happened out of all this so we got written into the state donations management plan and the state volunteer management plan. So hopefully the next time there's a disaster in New Jersey, and I say the next time because it's not a matter of if, it's really just a matter of when, the governor will be up there and not giving out a phone number or saying, oh, we need diapers or we need water, but saying if you want to help, go to helpnjnow.org. And that will, will bring resources into our state in a much more meaningful way. So let me see, what else did I have to cover? 
So that's really just the beginning of, of what can be done when we use our collective knowledge and experience of the veteran disaster organizations and, and you know, really take the, that collective knowledge and really pull everybody together in a way that, that makes it much more effective. So um, the hope is that with the more we work together, the more communities that are affected by disasters, they'll see a much smoother and more effective recovery because of the work that we've done here in New Jersey and the work that continues on. Um, you know, one of the things that's really cool is out of some of those things that we've done, we've built new relationships and partnerships, like with Rutgers University. So when they had an opportunity for a grant that they were applying for, they reached out to us and said, you know, you can help us to get it, this into the community, right? If we end up getting this, this would be a, and it's like a National Science Foundation grant, which has nothing to do with what we do. But because of the partnerships and the relationships that we've built, out of our call to collaboration, we've really been able to maximize that and I think hopefully make for a much more effective response and recovery here in New Jersey and elsewhere. So any questions? I've got there's a few minutes left before you guys have to move on. Right. Well, and, and I don't know that I know all the answers to that, but I can tell you what we've done, because we've been working with the New Jersey State Library System with Michelle Stricker, who's the executive director there. And the, and the libraries are all really either independent or run by the county or run by the municipality. So there's not sort of, I didn't realize that. I thought there was like, oh, there's just this network of libraries and they're all connected. And that's not necessarily the case. So it, it, the answer is different really for each one, because some of them are private and have their own foundations that raise funds. Some of them come out of taxpayer dollars. Um, but one of the things that we've been talking about is that you know what we're trying to do is really bring in some some additional resources because we know when a disaster strikes that's when money comes in so at th the program that we're doing helpnjnow.org um, I pay $16 a month to keep the volunteer database basically in there and ready to run but it costs by the number of volunteers that are in there so when I ramp it up for a disaster that's when it will um, the cost will increase but there will also be more opportunities for funding to come in to support that so unfortunately in these blue sky times finding funding for any kind of preparedness or resilience building is much more challenging um, there aren't a lot of organizations and foundations and corporations that invest in that stage but when a disaster strikes and there's that response and recovery more funds do come in and so a lot of times we end up getting it sort of on the back end so the investment we have to sort of scramble and try to kind of find you know so we're looking for some funds for me to be able to go around to all the libraries that want to be involved in this and do the training and it's really it's it's not a matter of them having to have anything additional quite honestly they have to have a, a you know a, a computer which they have tons of and access to the internet so assuming that those two things are in place they can do that and it's really just a matter of guiding the public into that Right. Right. Well, and that's what, and that's quite honestly why we turned to the libraries because we realized what a tr uh, what a tremendous role they played in the aftermath of Sandy. They were doing all this anyhow because they support their community. They open their doors to the community to keep them warm, to keep you know, to provide you know power and and access to the internet and access to information. That's what they do. And so they just they stepped it up when disaster struck. And and I think we I know we took notice of of the role that they played, and I know that some officials in government did as well. So who knows? Maybe there's some changes on the horizon for that but thanks for your comments anybody else have anything else if you're interested in anything that I shared there's information about help NJ now back there there's magnets and pens so you can remember just because today in the blue sky days it's basically a hub for preparedness information so if you go there today you won't find anything that I've talked about but you will find a repository of all kinds of information for people to know how to like make a plan and and you know how to get their pets prepared how to make disaster less scary for their kids. Things along those lines that are just okay, everyone, a good resource point for everybody. Session. So, do you, guys, do you guys ever like think about going to offer the training at schools for teachers? Um, our administration. I am so glad you asked that because actually one of the things that we are now 
New Jersey VOED is, is, we have a voluntary board and it's a staff of one, pretty much myself, and then you know a little bit of part-time help that I can pull in from time to time when needed. But we're, we're actually in the process right now of going for an application for an AmeriCorps planning grant that would end up being um, a, a component to be able to educate in the schools. And not just to, to bring that, so, we know that a lot of change happens when you educate your youth, right? You know, when your kids have, have when the fire, uh, you know, protection police and the fire fighters have visited the school, they all come back and they say, we need to do a fire drill. We need to fig figure out an escape route. Um, you know, public safety, things like wearing a seatbelt, that all came and th through the school. So for, for change to happen, we know it needs to happen in the schools. And so we're working, um, we're hoping to be able to get this grant to be able to build a continuum of education, of disaster preparedness education from elementary through high school school to not just help with it, you know individual and family preparedness but also with that community engagement and civic involvement um, that will happen from from being much more involved so